and gentlemen, my name is Toby Yunus. Stick with us a little bit. We're going to have a conversation about the coronavirus. As I said, my name is Toby Yunus. I'll be your host tonight, but along with me are two experts in different fields. With me is Shelly Carney, uh, who is a certified life coach, and uh, also with us tonight is Dr. Coffee Brown, a retired emergency medicine services physician. Uh, he presently works at the um, University of New Mexico uh, Medical Center, but I'm going to have them introduce themselves by name. Shelly? Okay, I'm Shelly Carney. I'm a certified integrative wellness and life coach. I specialize in life and career transitions coaching. That means I help people as they're going through transitions in their lives or in their careers. Uh, mostly we work with leaders and future leaders. And if uh, you're facing any sort of transitional time right now, uh, especially in your career or life, uh, please let us know. And we have some tools for you available. And that's all I have for tonight. <laughs> well, we've got some questions for you in just, just a minute. All right. Coffee? Um, Coffee Brown. I'm not quite as retired as I planned on. Looks like I'll be teaching for one more semester. Good. And um, I'll just put in a word for all the EMS people who are among those at risk taking care of folks during this period. Bless their hearts. Uh, before we get started, there's a couple of things I want to show you guys so that you're aware uh, they exist. The uh, First, I'm going to change over to full screen here in just a second as I open up our blog. Uh, so the first thing that you need to be aware of is uh, Dr. Brown is going to refer uh, to a variety of locations on the internet tonight. Uh, they all contain data or other kinds of factual resource. And we've made a collection of those on a blog that we run called covidconversations.tumblr.com. And uh, if you go there, almost literally everything that uh, uh, Dr. Brown refers to tonight uh, is listed in there. Uh, and you can go take a look at them yourselves. We, uh, we've we decided to make sure that you have access to facts. Uh, and this is where uh, you'll find them. Now, we also have uh, the listing for factcheck.org and snopes.com, as well as the CNN fact-checked website, so that if you hear what you think may be a rumor or a myth, you can use one of those fact-checking websites uh, in order to validate uh, what you're hearing. In addition to that, we're offering a free self-help tip uh, booklet during this difficult time uh, on thinking clearly, because I think uh, that's going to be the challenge for most of us. I'm going to put that link uh, in the description box below, as well as uh, the comments page or the comments box uh, on today's video. So if you'd like a copy of that booklet on thinking clearly, uh, you can download it. Uh, it's a free, free download. All right. So, uh, Shelly, uh, on with the questions back to you. Well, uh, actually, actually, uh, let me, let me, um, uh, stop there for just a moment. Uh, coffee and I had a conversation on Saturday and we talked about two topics that, uh, we thought should be addressed right now before we get on with our co uh, questions. So coffee, do you want to take uh, those, up, uh, based on the conversation we had this week? Uh, what are you thinking of first? Um, I liked the one about, uh, because I experienced it, uh, the correct behaviors if you think you're experiencing sy symptoms and may have contracted the virus. Uh, yes, kind of I the... have just what you need for that. All right. So symptoms is one of our headings tonight. Okay, good. And, uh, oh, I'm seeing it and you're not. <laughs> I do that every time. It's okay. See, symptoms. Says yeah. it right there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> So the major ones, the ones that nearly everybody with COVID has, are going to be fever and chills, cough, shortness of breath, to some degree. Now, remember, there's a lot of uh, mild presentations of this, and about half of people who are infectious don't have symptoms at all. So the range is enormous from you don't even know you have a bug to you die right. and everything in between. Some of the symptoms that we've discovered can go along with this, 
but not everybody would have them, would include fatigue and muscle or body aches, headache. Those things are pretty kind of generic for viruses. New loss of taste or smell is a funny one. Not too many things do that. It happened to me once when I had uh, mono in high school, but um, it's not that common. Sore throat, uh, pretty common. Uh, congestion, runny nose. Nausea or vomiting. Now, I've noticed that multiple times that whenever you have flu symptoms, meaning a non-productive cough, fever, body aches, and you have uh, either vomiting or diarrhea, so GI symptoms along with respiratory symptoms, almost always those are more severe bugs. H1N1 did that, Legionnaires, which is not the flu, but Legionnaires has that pattern, and uh, COVID sometimes has that pattern too. So I would say as a general rule of thumb, when people have what seems to be a garden variety flu, but also uh, GI symptoms, meaning nausea, vomiting, and or diarrhea, that combination is something you want to have your doctor check out. Uh, all right. And this uh, is a, a page I stole from a, a place called EM Crit or Life in the Fast Lane, which is one of the best blogs in my profession. And I pulled some stuff for lay people. But if you go to that site, you'll see that it's written for physicians caring for patients. And it gets into the weeds pretty fast. But this goes into some more detail about some of those symptoms. And as you say, these are available posted on the site. All right. So, uh, And this is... Uh, uh, I set this up to help people remind people what we've talked about for how to self-check. How do you feel compared to your normal? If you think you're significantly sicker than normal, talk to your doc. Maybe a phone call is enough if you don't, not worried that you're unstable. And we'll talk about how to worry about that in a second. But um, at least contact your physician. Let him ask you a few questions and tell you whether you need to go into the um, urgent care or call 911 or something. We've talked about O2 SAP monitors. I noticed prices on those are going up a bit. So demand has gone up and prices have gone mm -hmm. up. Still, uh, today I saw one that just jumped up on one of the pages I was looking at for $60, which is more than the 20 or so I've been predicting right. or, you know, used to. But still, I reason relatively affordable. Um, so if you're... <laughs> The reason I mention it here is that the SAT monitor will also tell you your heart rate. Every one I've ever seen also gives you your heart rate. Some of them will give you a respiratory rate as well. Uh -huh. And you always want to do a resting heart rate. If you walk in and immediately check your heart rate, it'll be a little speeded up. But the amount of exertion we do varies with every activity. So to get a, what we call a resting baseline, you want to sit for a few minutes first before you check your heart rate. All right. Same with blood pressure. You want to have a resting blood pressure. Know what your normal is. Yours will be different than mine. And uh, if it uh, is more than 10 points lower than you're used to and you feel crummy, you think you have a bug, contact your doc. Check on that. If your oxygen saturation is more than two points below normal, and I'm pulling that number out of the air. I'm just basing that on my personal clinical experience. That's not evidence-based. Right. I want to talk about that phrase, evidence-based, in a minute. If, you're, if yours is dropped by more than a couple of points, that's worth looking at. The reason is the normal range in our in my area is 94 to 98 ish, and so there's not a lot of wiggle room there to start with. Now at sea level, uh, up to 100 would be well 99 would be a reasonable percentage, okay. And below 90 gets dangerous. So you've got a little weasel room between 90 and 94, but not a lot of room. On the other hand, if you have chronic lung disease, you may have had to learn to live with oxygens that are at a lower level. So you're always comparing this to your own normal. Uh, respiratory rate should not be higher than 20 when you're at rest. Again, if you have congestive heart failure or something, yours might run a little higher, but that's less common. You know what yours is, but it shouldn't be higher than normal for most of us. Uh, peak flow, which not everybody is going to have, but if you invest in that little thing that you blow through and it moves the bar up, you want to um, check what your normals are on that. And a drop of more than 10%, discuss it with your doc. And if you're doing things you know you normally could do, I never have trouble with this flight of stairs. I've never had to sit down while I'm doing the dishes, you know, things like that. And now they're catching up with you and making you short of breath. You definitely want to contact your doc with that. So right. that's called decreased exercise tolerance. And here we don't mean exercise like going to a gym. It can be normal activities of your day-to-day -day life. Uh, 
next step we'll talk about test or go in. But I noticed that I use the phrase evidence-based a lot in, in these talks. And I want to explain what that means. Everybody feels they have evidence. If you think that, you know, our government is being run secretly by aliens hiding under human masks, you have something you consider evidence for that. And in your mind, that's valid evidence. But when I use that term as a physician, which is a kind of scientist, I mean it in the way that a scientist or a physician would mean it. There's a, a pretty strict, pretty organized set of rules about what does and doesn't constitute evidence. The basics of science are really simple. We talked about it last time. If I make a claim, you would ask me to show you evidence for that claim. But the reason it can take a long time to learn to be a good scientist is that there are so many things that look like evidence but have fooled us in the past. And so we've built this elaborate shrine of rules that are designed to help us not get fooled the same way that we've been fooled before. Most people don't use that in ordinary day-to-day -day life, and I don't necessarily think that they should. But when I talk about evidence-based, I mean things that have survived through that kind of rule set. They're still not always correct, and things that never were exposed to that kind of testing aren't always wrong. But it's the most methodical approach, and it's the one with the best odds so that's the one I use. So when I say something isn't evidence-based, I don't mean you, the listener, have no reason to believe it. I mean, it's not evidence-based in the way that a scientist would mean that phrase. Is that fair? Yes. Yeah. So if you're going to monitor yourself, your next question is going to be, well, should I go get tested or go in or see somebody? And that's what this part is for here. So uh, I showed you... Well, these are the emergency warning signs. If you're having trouble breathing, chest pain or pressure, altered mental status, any kind of new confusion. Normally I could do this math problem, but today I cannot. Normally I can do my own taxes, but today I cannot. Anything that's, you know, you're not thinking at your normal level and you don't know why, you can't, to, you know, account for it with four martinis at lunch, right? <laughs> well, then check with your doc about that. Um, Having difficulty staying awake is often a sign of low oxygen levels, of course, bluish lips or face. And uh, here's a note. People with anemia can get very low in oxygen and never turn blue. You have to have enough hemoglobin for the color to show. So an, a person with anemia may not get blue at the same level that you or I might. Um, and we always say this, and I actually mean it. It's paid off for me many times. If you think you're really sick, I believe you. Call me, you know, call your doctor and talk to them about why you think you're really sick. So if it's nothing on this list, but you think it's bad, that is plenty of good enough reason to contact your doc and have a conversation. Uh, CDC has this kind of guidance, but it's what we just talked about. So if you have some of the signs of COVID, but you're not sick enough that you have to go in and be seen right away, then that's when you would go down and get tested. And if you get tested and it's negative, you don't have COVID. First of all, we know that the positive test is more reliable, but you say you don't have COVID. You haven't wasted anybody's time. We want to survey the population. We want to get a better baseline. So if you go in and get a negative test, you have still helped correct the database. You've still done a good thing for your community, and it was worth the price of admission. Uh, all New Mexicans can now get testing, and here's where you can go to learn about that, and I believe you have that site posted as well. I did, yeah. All right. It's in the uh, description. It's the uh, for New Mexico. I didn't post the other states, uh, but for New Mexico, it is in the right. description box below. All right. And what was the other question? Uh, I think that was it. OK, so good. Talk to, that's what we talked about this weekend. All right, Shelley, over to you. OK, well, let us know, uh, Dr. Brown, where do we stand in the pandemic worldwide, nationwide and statewide? Well, I bet you know that's going to lead to having a look at our status board. So here's Johns Hopkins. We look at them pretty much every week these days. Um, the rate of new cases is falling off. Uh, and so we're only at 6.2 million now. Not a big jump. Not, not much more than – I can't remember what it was last time, but we're pretty close to where we were last time that we talked. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the U.S., we've now had 375 
thousand, sorry, sorry, 105,000 deaths. And the estimates are a little bit lower on the instruments we've been looking at, maybe around 130 or 35,000 deaths by August, mm -hmm. which is good. I'm glad to see that number come down a bit. But don't forget, that is not the total. That's by August. Actually, it's by um, um, July. And so uh, that number will rise a bit. And I'm concerned that it's going to rise significantly when we hit flu season around January, December and January. So watch out for that. So we haven't seen the end of it. So are, is it going to be difficult? How, how difficult is it going to be to distinguish someone uh, in that January, uh, December, January, February time frame, how difficult is it going to be to distinguish someone who's experiencing uh, or who's contracted the coronavirus as opposed to the annual flu? It's going to be quite difficult. When I look at the symptoms, I really do not feel that I would be able to distinguish them clinically. Um, if they lost their sense of smell or taste, that would push me significantly toward coronavirus. But basically, I hope we have plenty of tests by then. And I think we will. <laughs> Uh, I mean, everybody's trying hard to accomplish that. So uh, I, if I were, you know, the clinician seeing the patient, I would test everybody and sort them out in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and remember, it's quite possible to have both. So don't be surprised if both tests come back positive. Common things commonly happen together. Well, um, I, I was tested last Wednesday and there wasn't a big crowd at the testing location, but there were some people there. And to me, it was, uh, I, I, I was doing it just for safety's sake, right? Just to make yeah. sure I had some indications. Uh, but there were people there that I expressly avoided by staying on the far side of the room <laughs> that to me looked and sounded like they were sick with a flu. And this isn't the right time to have the flu. You know? Not the right time. So yeah. very, very good chance that they had COVID. But right. remember, even when we have a reasonable index of suspicion, the majority are still testing negative. negative. Um, we'll look a little bit more at that when we look into myths. People are underestimating the problem right now uh, to some degree. It doesn't help to over or underestimate it. And the problem is we're doing both at once, which <laughs> is which is really giving me headaches. Only in America. <laughs> no, probably everywhere. Uh, did that address your question? Anna? It did. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so that was worldwide, nationwide. Did we have any state information that was? Why? There? Yes, we do. You know, that was my fault. I interrupted before you. Um... So this is uh, New Mexico. As you can see, this is what I consider the most important of the graphs. There are others on this page, but um, essentially we've been doing a good job of flattening our curve. And I'll show you this curve in a second for the nation, and you'll see. This width, the dotted line is the projected course of the number of beds that we're going to need. The uh, purple cloud around it represents the uncertainty, the range of numbers that would still be within the prediction of the model. Mm -hmm. Okay, And with New Mexico, I don't know if that looks wide or narrow to you, but to my eye, that's pretty well controlled. That is, the range isn't really too wide. Now have a look at that same curve when we look nationwide, mm -hmm. see how much greater the uncertainty is here? Wow. Uh, so New Mexico is doing well in that regard. We're not the um, absolute best in the country in terms of managing the cases. So this is a map. Are you seeing a green and blue map? Yes. So this is a map uh, showing the hot spots and cool spots around the nation. And uh, right now, you see a couple of states, Montana and Wyoming, uh, that have very few cases, less than 1,000 cases. New Mexico is in the uh, next bandwidth up. So we're, we're doing well. Well, actually, we're two bandwidths up. We're in the uh, 5,000 to 10,000 cases. Okay? And of course, we have more population than some of these states, too. Uh, this is just by way of uh, scale. This is New York City. And of course, that's been our hot spot right wow. along. Cases, uh, new case rates are declining for New York City. So they're on the backside of that curve for the moment. Uh, a lot of the questions that come up in the discussions are, when will it be safe to reopen? And one answer is never. Whenever we reopen, we're going to see a bounce. But we want the bounce to be small and manageable. So bounce that doesn't overwhelm local health resources would probably be considered an acceptable bounce. And it certainly is the case that not opening is, is consequential in, in major ways as well.
that's all I got on that. Okay. All right. So uh, do we have any new data points that are standing out for us? Um, yeah, a couple of things are interesting. Uh, testing I wanted to revisit a little bit. So we talked about um, who gets testing. You know, when should you go in and get tested? Uh -huh. What do you do with the information? Um, well, quarantine is for people who are considered at uh, significant risk. So uh, you've been you've been around someone, somebody in your household, you know, has the infection, something like that, right? You just got off a cruise ship, you just came from a high risk area, something like that. Uh, isolation is when you uh, have been diagnosed as having uh, COVID. For quarantine, if you're in a high risk category but haven't tested positive. The thinking is you should sequester yourself for about 14 days, which is really unpleasant since you might not even be sick, but it's what we need to do to protect each other. And then uh, if you need to isolate, you need to go out to about 10 days after your last symptom. The range of recommendations is seven to 10 days, but this bug keeps surprising us. So I'm just going to say 10 days. Okay. That's how long I would isolate if I had the bug and got over the symptoms. Uh, incidentally, and one of the slides here talks about it, but you know, there's been a lot of rhetoric about, you know, they're trampling my rights. This is the first step toward big brother and fascism and oppression and things. Um, quarantines are older than this country is. Uh, quarantines have been around since the bubonic plague. And they're one of the few things that have worked effectively historically. George Washington and Abraham Lincoln would have been very familiar and comfortable with quarantines. And frankly, uh, Toby, so should you and I be. They continued right up into the 50s and 60s. Right. And there is a government list we looked at a few weeks ago that has like 20 diseases on it that are quarantinable now. People forget that we closed down schools during the Obama administration to uh, blunt the impact of H1N1 and mm -hmm. did other things like that. And it worked. You know, one of the reasons those things kind of fizzled out was we jumped on them quickly. We managed them aggressively while they were still small problems. It's always easier to put out a spark than a fire. It doesn't mean that spark wouldn't have burned down the forest. It means you got on it quickly. Good job. Pat yourself on the back. So there is nothing un-American, nothing new and unusual, nothing unconstitutional about quarantines. And there is absolutely nothing moral about saying, I don't care how many people I kill because I don't want to wear a mask because I'm going to make it a political statement. Well, you've made a political one and a moral one, and it's one that I'm pretty uncomfortable with. Hmm. Shelley? What new myths regarding the pandemic and virus have arisen <laughs> this week? I won't torment you by trying to cover them all because... Holy cow, there's always so many. Oh, here's something I did want to talk about, actually, right before we hit the uh, myths, and then we'll come back to that. <laughs> I'm a little surprised I have to do this, but apparently we all need to learn how to wear masks. And my friend Lorna has been making masks. She's donated over 600 masks wow. uh, to um, healthcare workers, and she lent me a couple that I could use tonight. So I'm going to take up that. Headset for a moment and switch back to me so I can show you a couple of things about mask wearing and then right. we'll come back to this. So what got me interested in this is I'm seeing all these people wearing their masks <laughs> like that. So here's all a, a bunch of different ways to wear it wrong. Can you see that sitting on top of my glasses? Yeah. And as a consequence, there's a huge gap all the way around. Right. That's not helpful. If you have glasses and this kind of mask, you want to put the glasses over the mask, not under it, like okay, that. Got it. Okay. I have, I, that's what I do. Now, another thing I'm seeing a lot is people wearing see, their mask like this. I see a lot of that. Well, if you want to announce to the world that you're a mouth breather, maybe that might make sense. Okay. But really, it's like wearing a badge that says, I don't quite get the concept here. I'm not dead sure how these things work. They're very confusing to me, right? So, no, we don't want to wear it like that. And then apparently there's a large contingent of people who are worried that their chin alone will get COVID. <laughs> and so they're protecting their chin from coronavirus. All right. Mm -hmm. And then there's the people who wear their sunglasses on their head and thoughtlessly do this. See, I'm wearing a mask. Right. Uh, I've seen all of these people just in the last few days. So the mask 
should cover your nose and your mouth and should fit reasonably snugly. This is a different one than I usually wear. I, I wear the sleeve kind that yeah. you sort of pull down over. Right. That's not necessarily the best kind, but I'm a little more used to it. Okay. So um, I'm not the only one who has noticed this issue. There's actually pages up showing people how to wear masks and how not to wear them. Mm. So these are wrong ways to wear a mask. This is the right way. These are all, again, on the slides. And, of course, these are the wrong way to protect yourself from right. COVID <laughs> as well. All right. So that was the masks. Now we'll go on to myths. Oh, myths of the week was the very next section. So perfect timing. Give you a second to read that. <laughs> All right. I liked it. Okay. I it um, ibuprofen. Here's the, the reason these uh, slides are so wordy is I'm trying to give people the background. I want everyone to be critical of their sources. That's how we get these myths under control. Mm -hmm. And since I'm one of your sources, you should be critical of what you hear from me. So when you hear something that's counterintuitive or you think I might be wrong or, or you know, your friend at work said it was different, follow the evidence backward until you find out the source of the information that you're getting. And so I try to make my sources readily researchable, okay? Uh, there are no specific medicines to prevent or treat the new coronavirus, except remdesivir, which doesn't reduce mortality that we can tell yet, but does shorten hospital stays for those who survive. Um, this has surfaced again. Can black and African people get COVID-19? When I first heard this, I had no idea what it was about. Honestly, I kind of suspected somebody was trying to get African-Americans killed. But it turns out there's a paper that looks at melanin in animals uh, as being associated with decreased risk from parasites. That has nothing to do with humans and viruses, but that seems to have been the source, at least one of the sources for this meme, and it is an incorrect meme. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, anti uh, HIV treatments are being looked at as a potential avenue of treatment for COVID. But even if they work, they'll have to be specific for COVID. So if you're on meds for HIV, they will not protect you against COVID. But you're also not considered at higher risk for COVID so long as you're uh, being adequately treated for your HIV. If it's being well controlled, it's not presently thought that your risk is greater because you're HIV positive. So that's the good news side of that one. Um, there has been some back and forth in the interwebs, as it were, on whether there's more than one kind of COVID. Uh, the current consensus among virologists appears to be, no, there's not. There's minor variants, like having a Southern accent versus a New England accent, mm. but not really different uh, strains of it. Certainly not enough to cause different symptoms, different uh, viral behaviors. It's thought not. Right. Yeah, it's not that we don't have, in fact, a mild and a, a minor and a major one, so to speak. Um, as I said, I don't want to walk you through all of these. Oh, we've seen oh, some this of one's them important, though. I'm sorry, go ahead. We've seen some of these before. Yeah, we have. Uh, going to someone's house can count as social distancing. I, I think I see where this comes from. You can be in groups with your household members. Well, what about my close friends and my family, right? They're my relatives. That should be okay. I'm just visiting my friend in this house. Unless they're the people you live with all the time, the chance of you guys exposing each other to a bug that one of you brought up somewhere, caught somewhere, is still pretty reasonable. So, no, visiting our friends during this period doesn't count as maintaining social distancing. And believe me, I want to visit my friends too. And I've had a couple of people come over on various kinds of business that they has to do. And I didn't always have a mask on. So I mean, it's, some of that's going to sneak through. But I don't tell myself a story that it counts as social distancing. Right. Smaller groups are better, but they are not safe. They're just not as dangerous. Uh, okay, talked about that. This one is worth spending a moment on. Uh, Ebola, swine flu, SARS, and Zika were just as bad as COVID, and nothing got shut down in the U.S. 
Uh, three of those occurred during Obama's administration. Things did get shut down. Aggressive measures were taken. And they did not turn out to be the plague here that they were in some other places. Uh, the other one didn't occur during uh, that administration. But um, here's the sort of the background on that. And again, if you follow this back to the link, these are um, highlighted HTMLs, but I wasn't able to copy and paste them as highlights. So you have to go back to the page okay. if you want to go back to the original uh, data. The death toll is not lower than the seasonal few, flu. It's not a mutated form of the common cold. Uh, so somewhere it, uh, there's a statement, the U.S. has done more COVID-19 testing than all other countries combined. That is flatly wrong. I'm not sure where it came from, but it's wrong. We may have done more than any other single country. We haven't done more on a per capita basis than a lot of other countries. And we're not doing enough to reopen. In uh, the minds of epidemiologists, we might need as much as 75 times more testing than we're doing right now, which is almost incalculable. And we're doing a quarter of a million Americans a day, and it's a drop in the bucket compared to what we need to actually have accurate information about the movement of this virus. Isn't that amazing? 328 million people really adds up. Wow. Yeah. Uh, antibiotics don't work on any viruses, including this one. Uh, add a little asterisk to that. Uh, there is one called Zithromax, azithromycin, that has some antiviral effect, but whether it has any effect on COVID is unclear. In a couple of small, non-blinded studies, it might. So watch that one. Zithromax might have a role, but not as an antibiotic, but because it's incidentally an antiviral in some settings. Um, the engineered thing that's been debunked over and over, packages from China. Peeled onions will protect you from coronavirus. I, I, I think this one's pretty obvious, but I included it because it's actually from the 14th century. That was a 14th century response to the bubonic plague, which turned out badly. Guys, excuse me. There is someone at my door. I'll be right back. All right. All right. Shall you just uh, go into questions? In I put in a long thing here that I'm not going to read out loud, but people can if they want to, showing the background for drinking tonic water will prevent coronavirus. Short answer, no, it won't. But the reasoning, how people would get that idea, kind of makes sense. But it's a story with a lot of links in a chain. So read it if it interests you. But that would be, you know, boring to read out loud. But the moral is clear. Rumors harm real people. People using quinine or a hydro... Uh, Chlor, uh, chloroquinoquine inappropriately have harmed themselves. So we don't want more of that. UV lamps could be used as a disinfectant, but it has to be UVC. Most of the ones like for tanning booths and that are UVA and UVB. They wouldn't work for this. And if it's strong enough to do that, it's plenty strong enough to give you skin cancer. So you might use it on objects like your mask, but just wash your hands for your skin or shower or whatever, you know, wash your face. There's a bunch of these little charts out showing in numbers how much of a different masks make. Those numbers are made up bogus numbers. Nobody has that information and it would vary too much from one context to another. The gist of it is true. Masks make a difference and wearing them correctly works better and they're more for the sake of the people around you than for you. But um, that when people give you specific numbers like this, they're bluffing. Um, runners and cyclists can project a coronavirus up to 16 feet. That's interesting. I, an aerodynamics engineer did some calculations and reached that conclusion. So I mean, it's an educated guess, but it hasn't been tested. It's you know, it's his math model. It's his back of the napkin model. Well, I was kind of thinking about that one. And I was thinking, well, if you're out there r running, then that means you can breathe. And <laughs> you told us that shortness of breath and unable to do regular, uh, your regular stuff, your regular exercise routine would tell you, I'm sick. I better stay home. I can't run. Well, those tell you that you're sick, but they don't tell you whether you have the virus. Remember, 50% of the people who are infectious have no symptoms, don't know that they have the bug. 
Uh, flu shots do not increase the risk of uh, contracting the virus. There are no alternative medicines, but this was the thing that made me want to talk about evidence at the beginning. Alternative means alternative to scientific evidence. I'm not making the case that alternative means wrong and scientific means right. I just want people to understand one of them is methodical in a way that the other is not. Um, and then if folks feel they're happy with non-scientific evidence, I think that's a grown-up choice people can make. I'm not faulting anybody for that. But when I say evidence, I mean of that strict formal kind within a particular discipline. Uh, positive antibody test means you have immunity. We hope so. We kind of expect so, but that has not been shown yet. And even if it is so, you know, what percentage of people? If it meant that 90% of people with positive antibodies aren't infectious, I'd say they could go around in public without masks. But if, in fact, it makes you 10% less infectious, yeah, we still need masks. So we need information on that that we don't have yet. The hope and expectation is that this will be true, but that's not proven yet. The COVID-19 death toll is being inflated. No, it is not. The death toll is quite accurate. Um, we know how many people died with a diagnosis of COVID. That's really clear. The case fatality rate, I thought, was being inflated because I thought as we elicited more background cases, the case fatality rate would fail. But when I divided the numbers today, the known cases in the U.S. and the known deaths in the U.S., our case fatality rate was up to 6%, higher than last time we talked, which mm. was around 4%. So it's going to fluctuate a little bit from one data set to another, but it's not low. Uh, even as we get more testing out there, the case fatality rate is re remaining higher than I thought it mm. would. So it's the opposite of this particular mean, and that surprised me. Um, the models are too grim. They don't take protective measures in, into account. They actually do. They're actually assuming everybody is following the rules, which is clearly not the case. And they're assuming that uh, uh, stay-at-home measures are going to be in place and social distancing at least until the beginning of August, which is clearly not the case. It's already being rolled back in various places. So the models are too optimistic, not too pessimistic, at least as viewed from this uh, memes standpoint. So is there uh, an expectation in the scientific community uh, at, at, as we reopen uh, our uh, state, our, our country, uh, that the virus will return and, uh, and we'll experience another peak? Or, yes. or, or we'll just be, fortunately, it's, we're done with, it's gone, goodbye virus, let's go on with life. That could possibly happen. Sometimes epidemics will do that. But the general expectation, it looks like from everything I've read, is that it is going to bounce, that this thing is around now. It's the new cold. It's going uh -huh. to be just a universal infection. We'll see it every year like we do the flu. That's apparently what people are thinking is going to happen. And it may not be seasonal. It may just be an, an all year long kind of thing. So we really need those vaccines. When you say, uh, and I, I was uh, thinking about asking this question last time, we know that we, there are certain times of the year that we experience the influenza virus. Why is it seasonal? What is it about the seasons that cause it uh, to be more virulent in one season and less in another? Um, it's characteristic of a lot of viruses to act that way. And I have always thought it had to do with human behavior patterns rather than the actual temperatures. But I don't want to bluff. I don't specifically know the answer to that. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, did we discuss all of the prophylactic and curative medicines, or did you have more information on that? I, except for remdesivir, there's nothing right now that's being recommended. Um, there, one of the myths, you're more likely to die from COVID if you put on a ventilator. That is true. Not because of the ventilator, but because we only put really sick people on ventilators. So, yeah, I mean, you're more likely to die if you go to the hospital than if you stay home because you're probably less sick if you stayed home. It right. doesn't mean the hospital killed you. If you need a ventilator and you don't get it, you're almost sure to die. Very nearly 100 percent. But by the time, what case. you're saying is by the time they give you a ventilator, you're you're on the on the death side of that algorithm. Yeah. You've joined the way sick club. So right. yeah. more of them die. 
right? <laughs> but, uh, and it is true that if you didn't need a ventilator and I put you on one for some whatever reason, uh -huh. uh, it, it would do you harm. Now, we can do it for short periods. People do it for minor operative procedures and things like that with no detectable consequences. Uh -huh. But if we put you on a vent for a few days and you weren't sick in the first place, you would be sick by the time we were done with you. So there's a grain of truth in that meme, but I don't want people to misunderstand it. If you need a vent, you need a vent. Don't decline it unless you're somebody who doesn't want heroic measures. Right. I'm, I might well sign a piece of paper that says, no, if we get to the point of event, it's time to stop. And that's a choice that a patient might make, but make it knowing the parameters, knowing that that's the choice you make. So uh, I, I don't recall uh, before this hearing about ventilators as being uh, an important part of, maybe I was just never that kind of sick, uh, an important part of the healthcare process. What, what, what are ventilators normally used for when they're not used for uh, this, the, the tail end of, of the coronavirus? The tail end of all kinds of illnesses, sepsis, um, people who want advanced care, uh, with end of life uh, kinds of issues, mm -hmm. um, preserving organs for transplants, um, burn patients uh, are likely to wind up on ventilators for a while. Uh, and some people go on ventilator, get just what they need from it and get back to normal. Most of us who go as far as getting on a ventilator, uh, if we survive, and most ICU patients do, will probably never quite be the same. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll at least have diminished what's called physiologic reserve. We'll never be as perky as we were before. We won't be as resilient to illnesses and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, it's a bad thing if you're sick enough to wind up on a ventilator other than for an operation or a procedure. Okay. In, in those cases, it's pretty benign. Mm -hmm. By the way, in case uh, anybody's interested, yeah. oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, my at my door was uh, three members of the Bernalillo uh, City Police uh, looking for information on a series of robberies, uh, break-ins that took place in the neighborhood behind our neighborhood, high-walled fence neighborhood. And they asked mm -hmm. me if I saw anything unusual or interesting. Turns out, this afternoon when I was on my run, I did see something that kind of bothered me. And I told them, and they were very grateful. So, How interesting. Uh, we don't really need to spend time on this. I just thought it was so eyebrow raising. So the COVID-19 is a cover up for Trump breaking up a child, a global child trafficking ring. I'm, I mean, it'll make a good movie. Yeah. You know, yeah. Or comic book or something. Yeah. yeah you, you can't make this stuff up except somebody does. Now, here's an example of us not being anywhere near critical enough. Anthony Fauci knew in 2005 that hydroxychloroquine could treat the novel coronavirus. Now, this thing didn't even exist until the end of 2019. <laughs> he's that good, man. He is that good. And he is that good, but he's not <laughs> that that good. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So that was what I had on that. Back to you, Shelly. Okay. Uh, where are we? People are starting to go out and more importantly, to go back to work. And my gym, in fact, is opening tomorrow as well. What do they need to do in order to avoid contracting the virus? Yeah, maintain social distancing. That doesn't go away. Um, use masks when you can't uh, maintain social distancing or when you're inside with groups of people. Um, wash your hands frequently. Don't share stuff. Like if you have an office state where you share, everybody needs to have their own now. You know, um, don't, uh, for example, I have a habit of making coffee for people when they visit. I need to stop doing that because I'm passing an object from my hand to their hands. Mm. It becomes a fomite. Remember, we talked about mm. those in the past, an object with virus painted onto it. So we need to be um, more about personal space than we have been in the past. And from a social standpoint, that's kind of a drag, but it's what we need to do for now. There was an interesting article in the New York Times about uh, Silicon Valley uh, and having having known that community for most of my career, uh, they were always it was always the open space environment. Let's make sure we can communicate. Yeah. No, no cubicles. And uh, uh, they've invested a lot over the past couple of months of putting cubicles, separators, you know, glass walls, et cetera, back up. 
uh, because at one time the open space was a darn good idea because it fermented, you know, lots of open thinking, whiteboarding, et cetera, et cetera. Now they're putting the walls back up again. So, yeah, I don't know. There's, there's downsides to both cubicles yeah. and open spaces, yeah. but either way, we're clearly going back to cubicles now right. and yeah. people working from home. And I would remind any managers that are listening, none of us has ever correctly estimated the size of a job. Every right. job takes much, much longer than you think it will. When you're assigning tasks to people you can't monitor and directly supervise, you're going to overestimate how many tasks they can do uh -huh. to a brutal degree. And so managers are going to need to have to develop a realistic sense of scale about managing by objective. And I mean, none of us can do that. Well, I can't do that for myself very well. Every day I make myself a task list and every day I get about half of it done because I always think I can do more than I can, let alone if I were operating somebody else and I want to make sure they're not goofing off and stuff like that. Right. You can see how that could snowball fast. Well, the other, uh, there was a second article about a survey that was done amongst management uh, in the New York City area, and uh, uh, the fact that they were surprised, they thought when everybody started working from home, it would just go chaotic and nothing would get done, and exactly the opposite happened. People are going home working when you know when they're when they're saying i'm working from home they are actually working from home and producing at least the same level of output and in some cases more than they were producing prior so yeah there's a lot of talk about keystroke minders and uh, dual screen monitors and stuff mm -hmm. i think that's creepy and abusive and the wrong answer mm -hmm. and I, by the way this is not i'm not speaking from any content expertise this is i'm expressing a personal opinion let me be clear but I think if you manage by objective, I don't really care right. if this person is watching soap operas half the day and then staying up till 10 o'clock to finish the objective. If the things I need at work are showing up on time for me to keep the workflow going, mm -hmm. they're doing their job. And if they can do that in two hours a day, who am I to complain? Yeah. Right? Uh, as long as they're doing appropriate work. And I should scale that based on the historical amount of work that got done, not based on predictions about the future. There's a really good section on this in Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, where he talks in detail about how he learned this lesson. Uh, he estimated a year and a half to write a textbook that 15 years later still wasn't finished. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and that was working with a large team. They all were super bright people who all agreed about how long it would take to write this thing, and they just had no idea what it took to write a uh -huh. textbook. All so, right. back to you. All right. What would be the impact of the United States cutting ties with the World Health Organization, as the administration has suggested? Ooh, yeah, I put something in here about that. Um, I think I have it at the beginning. Sorry, bear with me a second. Basically, um, the AMA has put out an official response saying, you what? <laughs> this is a, a terrible move. Oh, here we go. So here's that uh, information. We need to be working with the World Health Organization. They might be more sympathetic to China than we'd like. I have no information on that. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't care. I don't care. We all need to solve this problem. It's an international problem. The bug isn't treating American special or Chinese special. And this is the international body, the equivalent of the CDC at the global level. And I cannot think of a worse move you could make at a time like this than to pull out of the WHO. And that's if I believed that they were inappropriately sympathetic to China. I don't know that that's true. I'm quite sure that China minimized you know, the outbreak and, and blunted the news about it to their people. That would be characteristic of them. Guess what? Our government does that too. And they do that for propaganda reasons and to manage public opinion. And they do it for slightly different reasons. In China, it's an official party policy. And most of the people there think that's appropriate, apparently. Uh, in the U.S., we have the interwebs. We just throw so many lies out there. Mm -hmm. Nobody can keep them straight yeah. anymore. And, and that confuses the issue. So, yeah, China probably did try to put as good a face on their situation as they could. That doesn't amount to starting biological warfare against uh -huh. the rest of the world. And even if it did, we would still need the WHO to help us get things back under control. So 
I, you know, I try really hard to stay away from policy discussions, but this is colossally stupid on a scale that makes some of the myths look reasonable. I agree with you when it comes to policy issues, but I thought uh, just leaving them was uh, le- the potential for leaving them was an important uh, yeah. conversational topic. I mean, we had to at least discuss it. So I'm glad you addressed it. Sally, back to you. All right. Uh, now we're talking about an article in the New York Times. And by the way, I, I copied this from the New York Times, so I wanted to let you guys know this. All right. And I'll read it out loud, uh, the part that Toby has highlighted. A transmission mystery. Scientists don't yet know how much exposure to the coronavirus is needed for a person to become infected. But predictions have proved particularly tricky because it behaves so differently from other viruses. With the flu and HIV, for example, high levels of pathogens usually correspond with more severe symptoms and a higher likelihood of infecting others. But with the coronavirus, asymptomatic people seem to have viral loads as high as those who are seriously ill. Yeah, there's a fair amount to unpack there. I wouldn't quite use the word mystery. I would have said more along the lines of we're still finding things out. The fact is we know more about this virus in a shorter amount of time than would be the historic Norm, it would generally take about a decade to know as much as we know now about the coronavirus. Uh, So, you know, we have better tools, better science, better instruments, better motivation. And all that has led to really rapid learning about this. But that doesn't mean we know everything we'd like to know yet. So viral load means, do you know, can I sneeze invisibly on you and make you sick? Or do I have to actually leave a booger hanging off your face for a while, right? (laughs) It's, you know, how heavy does the exposure have to be? And for some things, the exposure has to be pretty significant. For example, to get tuberculosis from a household member, somebody you live in the same house with, generally takes around three months. Okay, leprosy, years. Common cold, pass them in a grocery store. Coronavirus seems to be more like the common cold. It's quite infectious. And so it appears that the load we need can be quite small. Now, some bugs... A lot of bugs are infectious before you have symptoms, but a lot of bugs, you're not infectious until you look like you're sick. So we're used to saying, avoid that person and you won't get ill, right? With a flu or a cold or something, it tends to to work that way. Uh It appears that different people's immune systems react very differently to the coronavirus. So if yours reacts really optimally, you don't get sick at all. And that's about half of people, apparently. On the other hand, if yours overreacts, you're at much greater risk of dying. And that is one of the characteristics of the older patients is that they have these overreactive immune systems, but so do some other groups as well. Um, It's confusing. Based on that, you would predict that women would die more than men because women tend to have more reactive immune systems, but apparently they're more appropriately balanced to the coronavirus because women are doing a little better than men are, even when you account for things like smoking and stuff like that. Um, so we're still learning its patterns and its behaviors, but it appears that a smaller amount of this will infect you than most viruses. And it appears that there are so many asymptomatic people spreading it that it's really hard to know when you got exposed. And therefore, how long exactly is the incubation period and how big is exactly the viral load? And then finally, because our bodies react differently to it, even if all three of us got sick now today at the exact same moment with the exact same viral load, we might have three very different courses Hmm. by the time we're through. So not mystery, just it's new and we're finding these things out about it. All right. (laughs) All right. So Shelly, I'm going to take over here. What did you have something you want to say? Me? No, I just thought he's like, he says, it's not a mystery. It's just something we don't know yet. I'm like, well, isn't that a mystery? <laughs> I guess a, a mystery to me would be something that seems unaccountable or or irrational, you know, illogical on the surface of it until you work it out. None of this is actually terribly surprising. Hmm. Certainly not irrational. It's just a matter of we're collect we're still collecting the data on it. Yeah. 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 All right. But well, I get your point, Shelley. It's like saying, I haven't lost my glasses. I just don't know where they are. Uh, oh, I know that feeling. <laughs> I get it. I know that feeling. Yeah. That happens a lot. 
All right, let's uh, go on to some life co- coaching questions on these matters. Uh, we'll start with Shelly and then follow up with you, um, Coffee. Uh, Shelly, most people are complaining they eat more and more poorly as a partial substitute for their normal activities. How can we learn to enjoy healthier pastimes? <laughs> well, awareness is the first step. So if you find yourself putting on weight and uh, succumbing to ice cream and, and cookies and other things, it's very likely that you're doing that because you're feeding your inner victim, right? Oh, well, I have to suffer this, so I'm going to treat myself with that. Uh, so, but recognizing that I'm not a victim, this is happening to everybody, I'm fine, everybody's okay, I don't need to have treats in order to, you know, uh, tell my inner child that, you know, everything's going to be okay. Just be aware that it's going on and then take a look at your feelings. A lot of times we overeat or we eat to mask whatever we're feeling. So if you're feeling fear, anxiety, worry, address those feelings. Take a good, strong look at them and and decide uh, why those feelings are there, what they feel like, are they serving you, and then perhaps uh, process through them and then find a feeling that you would like to have instead and change your thinking about it. You know, uh, we need to think thoughts about the future instead of being worried and anxious. Maybe we could think I'm curious as to what new opportunities might come out of this. So we need to work on our thought management. And when we can get everything uh, under control with our thought management, then the uh, eating out of hand takes kind of takes care of itself and and you get back on track with your healthy habits mm-hmm. i think uh, uh another thing uh, to remind yourself of if you are experiencing some of these fears and anxieties is that uh we have lost over 104,000 souls and uh, it's I think each of us regrets that in our own way we've had uh almost a half million cases in the u.s is that right uh coffee Yes. Yeah. But when you look at that in terms of the percentages, the likelihood of you uh, 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 contracting the disease is a relatively small possibility. The likelihood of you dying from uh, the disease is an even smaller likelihood. So you have to look at this from the positive side. And the positive side is there's a very small chance that you're going to contract this disease. There's an even smaller chance that you're going to die from it. And if you're behaving uh, in a way that supports uh, prevention, uh, social distancing, mask wearing, hand sanitizing, those were things that we didn't do at the beginning of all this because nobody took us took the uh, disease as seriously as uh, we should have. Uh, so uh, keep in mind that that this is something that we can deal with. We have the capacity to deal with this, um, and and uh, the likelihood of you getting that you have to look at the positive things, not be fearful of these negative things that are su- such a small chance of. Uh, happening. And if, like I said, you're behaving in a way that helps you prevent uh, contracting the disease, good for you. That's positive, positive thinking, and it'll enable you to move forward. Uh, Coffee, anything you want to add? Um, I shouldn't have answered yes by reflex, so I double-checked myself. About 1.8 million cases okay. in the U.S., yeah. but that's out of 328 million. Right. That, that's so, so one-third yeah. of one percent. Uh, basically less than one in 150 of us right. has been confirmed to have this. Right. Of those, um, half will have a will, will not even be symptomatic. So now we're down to one in 300 of us actually getting sick. And of those, 20% will go to uh, the hospital. Now, that does bring up something else I wanted to show you guys tonight. Okay. I really do not want people excessively worried about COVID. But at the same time, there's the whole, oh, there's not even really a problem group, you know, that we have to think about. And so it's to that group that I want to address this next bit. Um, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Oops. There we go. Are you seeing a slide? Not yet. Okay. 
rats had just handed up where to go. Hmm. Oh, there we are. Okay. So this thing's confusing me here. All right. See Chuck Norris right now? Yes, we do. Okay, <laughs> we're where we need to be. So not that many die, right? It's six percent. It's the oldest and sickest six percent. And you know, we've already talked about the percentage wise, these numbers seem low. But look at some of the other things this can do. Toby, we talked about getting into some of the comor some of the morbidities of it. Right. So death is not the only thing that COVID can do to you. Blood clots, including blood clots in the lungs, strokes, heart attacks things like that. DIC is when you become a hemophiliac and you have strokes and so forth at the same time. You have a problem with too many clots, but also bleeding like a hemophiliac simultaneously. All right. Uh, Multi-system inflammatory syndrome we talked about last time, and this has been seen in some children where the organs, any different organ system, including the brain, pancreas, kidneys, can get inflamed and shut down. Renal failure. Uh, so for those patients who go to the ICU, 20% of them are going into renal failure. All right. And that's going to be a problem for some of them after they get out as well. Uh, inflammation of the heart causing a thing called myocarditis that makes the heart beat weakly. Sometimes you recover from that. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes it means that a 20-year-old could wind up with congestive heart failure and need a heart transplant, even though they survive the infection itself. We talked about heart attacks themselves, which uh, in my world is called uh, myocardial infarctions. Pulmonary fibrosis. Remember I said you can get permanent uh, respiratory impairment Uh from this disease. Liver um, enzymes bumped up, but usually doesn't make people, not really liver failure. So I don't want to over, I don't want to exaggerate. Neurologic symptoms have been pretty common apparently. So that would include things like strokes, seizures, confusion, um, encephalopathy, which you might think of as dementia, things like that, okay? Septic shock. Um, Pregnancy-related problems have been low. That one actually we're doing okay on. And uh, secondary infections occur in some percentage of these patients as well. Uh, A nasty fungal infection of the lungs called aspergillosis has been cropping up in some of the patients. Um, So... I want to make clear that just looking at how many people die underestimates the problem. And it's a big problem if you just look at that, but it underestimates the problem because there's all these other kinds of harm and there's all the people who can't get care they need because the hospitals are all full up with COVID. So, you know, don't panic. We're not, it's not the end of the world. We're going to be fine. We're going to get through all this on the one hand, but don't shrug and say it's a nothing. Let's just forget about it. Uh-huh. On the other hand, that will make the problem worse, not better. Right. The point I wanted to make uh, about fear is fear tends to be paralyzing. Uh, and uh, and in order to make sure that you don't contract this virus, uh, you're going to have to take some some actions. You're you're not you're not going. You can't be paralyzed by all of this and not take action to protect yourself and the people around you. All right, Shelley, we're ready for another one. Sure. Two errors are to, uh, just got this all right. Two errors are to be too dismissive <laughs> and appropriate precautions, or be more anxious than the situation warrants. How can we strike the best balance? Again, you want to stay aware of what's going on in your mind. A lot of us, as you were talking about fear, a lot of us, as we have those fearful feelings, we cease to use our prefrontal cortex and we move into our lizard brains and we just react. We don't respond, we react. Uh, one of the ways we can react is by, I don't see it, it, can't, it doesn't exist because I don't see it. Uh, it's not real, it's a hoax, I don't see it. Well, that's fear. Uh, that's, we're just in denial, right? Because we're afraid. The world's changing, I don't like change, I'm afraid of change, I don't see it. Uh, the other way is to be constantly updating, you know, oh, what's the news now, what's the news now? And uh, just letting it bombard you and stress you out and cause all that fear for you. And then you 
uh, spread that fear, <laughs> just like a virus, to your family and your friends and anybody on Facebook. Um, so we need to be aware and conscious of our feelings. We need to be uh, able to handle fear by admitting that we have it, talking through it, processing it, and uh, letting it go so that we can think, uh, think clearly and uh, as an observer of what's going on rather than uh, being afraid and right in the middle of it. Coffee, anything to add? Yeah, here's a diagram of part of what uh, Shelly is talking about right here. This is the uh, amygdala. It lives down in the lower part of the brain. And it's the part that's responsible for panic reactions, fight or flight. We're called vegetative functions, lust, rage, hatred, um, and mostly negativity kind of lives here. Hmm. It's the kind of low level reactive part of our brain. This here is the frontal cortex. This person is looking to our uh, left, by the way. So the eyes will be out over here. Uh -huh. This is the frontal cortex. It has what are called the executive functions of the brain. They allow us to manage, to self-manage. This is the part of the brain that says, no, I'm not going to have ice cream. I've had enough calories today. I'm not going to have cookies. I'm not going to uh, throw a punch because this guy said something mean to me at a party. I'm not going to key this guy's car because he insulted me, right? This uh -huh. is the part that can manage that. Now, our culture doesn't really place a high value on the prefrontal cortex, although nearly anybody who is successful has a well-developed prefrontal cortex. This is the part you need to get to college, to learn a profession, and to manage your finances. Now, the reason I'm going into so much detail is that when our amygdala is activated by anger or fear, don't tread on me, this is oppressive, or oh God, oh God, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, the amygdala doesn't just fire up our sympathetic nervous system, our panic reaction, it shuts down the prefrontal cortex. It actually shuts it down so that it can't do its normal job. We become way stupider, but faster, coarser in our actions, but braver. We're less wary of the consequences of our actions. And this is a guy who picks a fight with a barroom bouncer and things like that, right? And goes home with no teeth. This is the part of us that makes terrible decisions because, well, this is the part of us that prevents terrible decisions. And this is the part of us that overrides that and says, no, got to go, got to go, got to go, got to go right now without thinking, without judging and without looking around. It doesn't look both ways before it crosses the street and it will get us hit by a bus. Huh. <laughs> so a uh, quick question. Where, uh, where does the, um, combat field field of combat hero uh, exist in that model your combat hero is a guy who has learned to reassert his prefrontal lobes and using a variation of an expert typically i'm thinking about a navy seal technique here right um that kind of reflects what we were taught when we were kids when i was a kid i hated being told count to 10 if you get angry oh i hated that but now that I understand the neurophysiology, that actually buys time for the prefrontal cortex to come back online. Why? Navy SEALs have a little what they call four by four breathing exercise. Anybody can look it up on the internet. Highly recommend learning it. And what it does is it buys you a few moments to reassert that higher part of your brain. That's the thing that makes you special. Everybody has an amygdala, wolves, rats, roaches. The roaches don't, but rats have amygdalas, right? <laughs> But humans have a prefrontal cortex that's unique in the in the world of animals. That is our big claim to fame. If uh -huh. you turn that off, you might as well be a pit bull yeah. on a chain. Uh -huh. And so professional soldiers don't go into fight or flight mode when they're in the middle of a battle. They let their training assert itself and take over, and they actually calm down during a battle. In fact, a battle can be so conducive to that they can get addicted to it and have trouble staying calm when they're not in battle. That uh -huh. becomes its own opposite problem right. in some cases. So uh, I did get a text message. Thank you very much. Uh, I am not angry at Shelly. When I'm staring, I have to stare at the screen and I'm <laughs> squinting and it makes me make a face. So it's not an angry face. It's just a squinty face. All right, don't so. But thank I you. I don't think anybody can be angry at Shelly. <laughs> Shelly, has anybody in the world ever been mad at you? Just I say no. So. Uh, not since I was really young. And yeah, he was just I believe it. Uh, yeah. He was just a 
with the meanie. He was uh, <laughs> he was working amygdala. So, yeah. All right, uh, Shelley. One last. Oh no, no. This is uh, one more after this. The decision to wear a mask has or not has somehow become a political signal. How can we encourage each other to follow science rather than ideology? Um, putting on a mask is is the act of telling yourself and everybody around you that the world has changed. And uh, some people are like, I don't want the world to change. Um, I'm going to fight the world changing. And they're unable to accept what is. They're want, they want to fight with what is. And whenever you fight with what is, you suffer. Uh, and unfortunately, the people around you are going to suffer as well. So they don't want the world to change. So they're just saying, no, I grasp at any reason not to change, not to have to do that thing that says, you know, that the world has changed Mm -hmm. and I can't stop it. So again, it's fear. Uh, Why they want to do it uh, or don't do it is is fear. Uh, The people who are wearing masks aren't wearing them for political reasons. They're wearing them because they're told it's going to help keep everybody safer and healthier. And they're all for that. Um, The people who aren't wearing them are just afraid of change. That's my take on it. Hmm. I agree with Shelley that not wearing a mask is much more of a political statement than wearing a mask is. It's the wearing the mask is the default. So choosing not to wear one is a statement, wearing one less so. But look, in a democracy, I would never expect us to all agree on pretty much anything. Mm-hmm. I pick this brand of car, you pick that brand of mm-hmm. car. I dress in this color, you dress in that color. I like, you know, my dogs are all mixed breeds. You have purebreds, let's say, Right. We expect to disagree about things, but there are certain decisions we have to make as a community. It might be that masks aren't helping or that they're overkill or something like that. But as a community, we have decided that. And if you say as an individual, I'm going to reject what everybody around me think is for the good of us all. Because I am just so specially wise and uniquely Mm -hmm. endowed that my judgment is better than everybody else's. Well, you know what? We all feel that way from time to time. I feel that way every time I realize Facebook still exists. But I don't burn down Facebook, right? right? And I don't castigate people who use Facebook. I personally am astounded that anybody would get information from Facebook and treat that as if it were an information right. source. But I respect the fact that other people can make different choices. I'm a hardcore science guy. I like my methodology scientific. But I have lots of friends that are into alternative medicine, and they're wonderful people. So if you think a mask isn't actually something we need and you find it inconvenient, I would remind you that if you want to call yourself an American, as if you were part of something bigger than yourself, America has decided masks are a good idea, and you are choosing to say, no, I don't care about my country, I don't care about my community, and I don't care if I scare other people, even if you're right and the rest of us are wrong, which is not impossible. That is the statement that you're making. And know that and know that the rest of us recognize you for the flaming asshole that you are. <laughs> I was uh, very proud of my uh, fellow New Mexicans. I was at Albertsons today, and they've effectively opened up the store. They're not limiting the numbers of people. And the first thing I noticed is that everybody was very uh, uh, in a very genteel way, giving us, each of us, our six-foot space. Uh, and I was really surprised at the high percentage of people, somewhere above 95, uh, that were wearing masks and uh, just kind of living and, and keeping the six-foot distance. The, there's markers, of course, in the aisles and things like that. Uh, but But I was really very proud of the, uh, like I said, my fellow New Mexicans who were behaving in a very, you know, caring manner uh, just by what they were doing. So it's good to see that. Last question for you, Shelly, tonight. Ooh, and this is a toughie. As life coaches, what are some of the most and least what are some of the most and least useful strategies your profession has seen in your clients? 
Well, the uh, least useful would be to give in to your fears and anxieties and worries and just, um, you know, uh, not be able to admit that this is what's happening, this is what's real, and, and it's all going to be okay, and I can deal with it. Uh, but instead, like saying, I can't handle this, or, or just I give up, uh, something like that would be un, not, not useful, would not serve you. The, the most useful is there has been a lot of people stepping up, uh, offering coaching, offering more uh, specific coaching about pivoting or transitioning or um, you know, specific to people's needs right now. And people have stepped up a little bit more about accepting that help, mm -hmm. uh, reaching out for that help and wanting uh, to to get some help and admitting that this, you know, it's not, it's not a bad thing to ask for help or to get help. Uh, it's, it's a good thing. It's going to help you through those times when it's hard and people around you are acting crazy and buying all the toilet paper and not wearing their masks and, and whatever it is that you think is crazy um, to help you get through those transitional times. Or perhaps you're being furloughed or your business is having to go through some great big change because now everything has to go online or now you have all your employees have to wear masks or big changes are happening. Change is a really difficult thing for people to deal with unless they have the tools to manage that change, manage their thoughts and help the people around them. That's what life coaching offers people is those tools. Uh, you know, I'm, we help you to understand how your, how your thinking process affects your life and how to manage that and control, uh, you know, not letting things get out of control. Or if you have, you know, a time of day, uh, when, if you're worried all day long, we can help you to bring that down to just maybe 10 minutes of worrying and then getting on with your day after that. Um, so we have a lot of tools that we can offer people. Uh, and I do see more people reaching out and looking for those tools, accepting those tools and employing those tools. And that can be really helpful, not only for today, but all the way into your future as well. So that's what I have. Uh, as an example of that, we had a client that we discussed that we spoke with this week. And um, we asked her how she was doing. And she got up out of her chair and went to, and closed the door to her office. She owns a business. Uh, she's a longtime uh, business owner here in Albuquerque. And uh, she wanted to tell us what was going on. And uh, uh, not that it was discouraging for us, but I was surprised to hear from her that she was thinking about shutting down the business. And uh, I was surprised by that, but I was especially surprised by that coming from her because I've never seen her as that kind of quitter. But she was having to make some difficult decisions, and she knew what I already knew, and that is that within the next three years, the American economy is going to shed th uh, one-third of small businesses. And she envisioned the possibility uh, that she was going to be one of those. This is the time... so. Uh, I'm going to go back to um, uh, Coffee's comment about special operations training. One of the things you learn in special operations training is take action, right? There are times where you should stop and think, but you should never stop and not think. Uh, and then take action, move, pivot is a is a good a word that Shelley just used. And what you learned is if uh, one of the the kind of rules of battle is the battle plan is uh, is uh, ineffective after the first shots have been fired. Uh, and at that point, you have to pivot. You have to take uh, all of your skills, everything that you've learned, and pivot and uh, take those skills and apply them in a very agile and adaptable way. And that's what's going to the, separate the winners from the losers in all this. Not that I want anyone to be a loser in this, but whether you're an individual working in a business, whether you're a business owner, or whether you're uh, uh, a, a self-employed person, this is the time to consider what other things you can do, what other things you can learn to move forward in this very uh, 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 this economy that's going to change how we all behave. It is going to touch 
every one of us. And I think that uh, Shelley describing this as uh, pivoting is a, is a good way to do it. And you can overcome your fears of not doing anything. Fear is, as I said er, uh, earlier, paralyzing. The best way to overcome those fears is to take action. Sometimes the first step in taking action is learn what the possibilities are, make some choices, and then no, pursue those possibilities with a vehemence, and you won't have time to be afraid. So, uh, Coffee, anything else you want to add? Um, by the way, the way I always say that is no plan ever survives contact with the enemy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, the, the world is full of uncertainty. Um, we've been getting lectured all of our lives that the world is changing faster than ever before and we have to be adaptable. I would say that one way, one, one thing that makes people anxious is that they feel they have no power. They're just waiting to find out, am I going to get COVID and die? Right. Or is my grandmother or you know, am I going to give somebody COVID and kill them? Would actually scare me even more, uh, to be honest with you. One thing you can do is go out and get information. When you come across a meme or a thing that may or may not turn out to be true that uh, worries you, follow it back. Find out what the truth is. Find out what's actually known about it. Seeking information for some personalities, mine included, can help you to feel less uh, helpless. And the other is find ways to help other people. Again, this may be not every personality might react the same way, but for me, when I do work for other people, uh, my own problems just go away completely. So my friend Lorna is making these masks. You guys, uh, thank, thanks to you guys, we're doing these podcasts, which I put a lot of hours in every mm-hmm. week. And I'm doing it because it's my way of trying to help right. during this time when we could be falling apart. You look around you and you can see that if you do nothing, if you just stand back, the people around you are tearing each other apart. They're turning everything into a political fight and stuff of that kind. If you make it your job to help rebuild bridges that are being broken right now, you will be doing exactly what the people around you need. And it will take all of your effort and all of your wisdom and all of your insight. And that should keep you too busy to fret about yourself. That would be my, my pitch. I, I, think, I, I think that's spot on. I, I think that's absolutely spot on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. Remember that we have a a blog where you can find a lot of the information uh, that Coffee has presented to you tonight at covidconversations.tumblr without the E in tumblr.com. In addition to that, uh, I've put the links for uh, Coffee's presentation as well as our blog, as well as that free booklet on... um, Clear thinking. Clear thinking. Well, that was timely. Thank you. Wasn't about uh, memory, right? It wasn't about memory, <laughs> which is. Uh, I put those uh, in the chat room as well as in the description box below. And then finally, if you do have questions for Coffee uh, Dr. Brown, uh, please send them to covidconversations at gmail.com. And uh, every weekend I make a list. I get them to Coffee as early as he can because I know he has to. He puts a lot of effort into this. As you'll see if you download his presentation, uh, he puts a lot of work into it. And uh, he makes sure, uh, you know, he's, uh, science is on his side and he's on the side of science. So what he's telling you and what he writes in those, uh, in those uh, presentations are fact and have good sound uh, research behind them. So keep that in mind. Don't, don't uh, foment the myths. Uh, there's lots of ways to uh, find out how quickly they are myths and don't spread them. Take care of yourself. Wash your hands regularly. Maintain social distancing when you go out. Uh, wear a mask and insist that the people that you care about are doing exactly the same thing. And that way we'll all get this, uh, get, all, get through all of this together. Last words, Coffee. June 10th, New Mexicans for Science and Reason is having a um, Zoom meeting. They meet every month typically in person, but of course this month right. we're having a Zoom meeting. And this one will be on COVID, and I will be one of the panelists. And uh, so I was going to send you guys a, an invitation to that anyhow. Oh, please Perhaps do. Perhaps you might want to mention that on your site as well. Oh, we will. Yeah, we'd appreciate that. And is it uh, open uh, to uh, everyone viewing? You don't have to be a member yeah. of the site. Yeah. Great. Please send me uh, that link, and I'll make sure that we uh, promote it in our various programs. Thank you for that. Shelly, last words? Uh, just again, if you are needing some help to get through this time of transition, reach out. It's, uh, it's the best way to get through it 
the easiest, the quickest to turn yourself around and accept what it is and really look for opportunities. So reach out to uh, us and grab that booklet on clear thinking and we hope to talk to you soon. Uh, and uh, I do want you to know Shelly is my not only my partner and uh, friend, she's also my coach and uh, convinced me that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Coffee, thank you, Shelly. Thank you. Those of you watching, thank you. Please take care of yourself. We'll get through this uh, together, all right?